Good morning. Welcome to the nerd session. Um, so I've got, I've tried to be good um, and uh, given you um, lots to follow along with. So my slides are there, my text is there, which I'll try not to deviate from too much, but who knows. Um, and the demo I'm going to show um, is there, but I'm going to I'm going to talk for a bit before um, before I go on to the demo. So I'll leave that slide up for um, just a couple of minutes, so you can put those URLs in if you want to. Um, and let's see. So I'm going to talk today about ongoing work to develop standards and tools for publishing digital critical editions for the Digital Latin Library. The DLL is a joint project of the Society for Classical Studies, the Medieval Academy of America, and the Renaissance Society of America, with funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, to whom we give great thanks. The project is hosted at the University of Oklahoma, and Sam Husky, who's the chair of the OU Classics Department, is the principal investigator. <coughs> Does everybody got those who wants them? <laughs> okay, not hearing any more screams of pain. I can always go back to that slide if you need to. So, um, you know, as one does, um, I went and looked at the definition of interface. I, I kind of expected to find a Latin derivation. Um, probably from something like uh, interfeo to, to put between, um, which is the passive form of interficio, which means, among other things, to murder someone. Um, but I was surprised to find it's, it's actually a very recent coinage. It's a hybrid word. Um, so it's Latin inter plus the French English face, as in surface. Um, so in the context of this conference, we pretty obviously mean it in the sense of user interface, right? Um, it's a mediation between a digital system and the human beings who use it. So what do interfaces do? Um, well, they, they hide information, they hide implementation details. Um, they hide complexity. Um, all kinds of different things may happen in the background when you type something into a search box on a website, for example. But all you need to know is I put something here, I uh, hit enter or hit the button next to it, um, and I get results. Hopefully I get what I'm looking for. They, they serve as, as a kind of uh, uh, a contract um, that governs the interaction between two parties. A good interface tells you what it will and won't do for you. Um, an API, for example, in programming is, is just really a list of functions you can call with hopefully an idea of what will happen if you call them if your documentation is good. They, they serve as, as kind of generalizable protocols. Different systems can implement the same interface. Um, again, think of our search box. Um, and you'll know how to operate the system even if you've never seen it before because you understand the contract. Um, once you understand how restaurant menus work, for example, you can order at pretty much any restaurant, right? And because interfaces do all these things, they, they act to steer you in a particular direction as you interact with them. Um, so really, interfaces have a rhetoric. Um, and it's, it's, worth, it's worth paying attention to that fact. Basically, interfaces simplify things. They present you with a surface beneath which you can't see and that surface has on it whatever switches and knobs you're allowed to use to do things with the larger object. They clarify. They say, this is what you can do here. Um, but they can also obscure, right? They can say, don't look behind the curtain. Interfaces are everywhere once you start to look for them. Languages are interfaces. Computer languages, obviously so. Um, but even human languages, to interface with someone, after all, is, is to meet with them and talk to them. 
When it comes to editions as interfaces then, the idea must be that here, I as an editor give you a text and along with that text, I'm giving you some filtered um, insight into that text history and why I decided to construct the text the way I did. But I'm not giving you everything, just what I've decided is important for your understanding of the text. I'm hiding complexity. I'm promising you some view into that complexity via the apparatus and the description of the sources, the stemma, whatever. I'm doing this in a standard way. Once you know how to use a critical edition, um, you can pick up pretty much any critical edition and use it the same way. So a printed edi edition has a surface that we see, and that surface reveals information about the constitution of the text that the editor considered important. The surface hides a lot of the work that went into the editor's construction of that text. So the collation, for example, um, it defines what it's going to give you by listing its sources and the symbols in the apparatus used to identify them, the sigla, and a rationale for deciding on which variants were promoted to the text by the editor. And since they use a pretty standard form, hopefully there's a guarantee that anyone who knows how to use a critical edition will be able to use your critical edition, will be able to read it. So, but now I'm going to digress just a little bit. Um, because the kinds of edition that I'm talking about and that I have in my mind um, and that I'm going to present today may be different from what you think of as an edition. I'm a classicist by training, and our texts are a dire, dire mess, right? You may think you know mess, but you don't know classical mess. The originals are almost always, they're gone, like really gone, past the event horizon gone. All we have are old, but way, way younger, like a thousand years younger um, than the original copies. Um, and so we, we have problems with this. We, we don't usually even know if there was a thing like a singular original, right? In fact, we can often be pretty confident that there wasn't. Um, Homer, there was no original text, probably. Um, there might, yeah, we won't get into that. Um, so when we talk about critical editions, what we usually mean, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, is a painstaking attempt to construct a text that asymptotically approaches an idea of what the author might have written. Not a task for the faint of heart. Um, <clears throat> but it's also, I think, not precisely what all of you imagine when you think of a critical edition. Right? If you're working with Mark Twain, you have original sources. Um, we, we pretty much don't, um, ever. Um, I mean, this is okay, but I think it's important to be aware that our interfaces, um, human language in this case, can be a bit treacherous. They may hide too much. Critical edition has different meanings to different people in this room, right? And I think that's worth keeping in mind. So back to the messy implementation details then. Um, I'll show you the text we're going to work with. I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. What of this kind of traditional critical edition should we carry over into a digital critical edition? What can we do better? Um, for the Digital Latin Library project, we talked for a long time about this during our planning period. There were a lot of opinions out there. Some people think you should do away with the idea of an editor-mediated edition and just provide access to all the sources, um, along with, obviously, tools for <coughs> comparing and contrasting them um, so users can see, can navigate the textual tradition as it really is. Um, this is, again, at root the argument that inter interfaces are treacherous, right? They can betray you. They can lie to you. But we decided in the end that there's still a place for traditional critical editions, where an editor has considered the textual tradition and produced an argument for a particular text. Not that there's anything wrong with giving people access to the sources, of course, but we felt and still feel 
that turning the full fire hose on to people who just want a text to work with was unkind. Um, and that feeling applies not just to students, but to advanced scholars as well. I mean, after all, how can you do any higher criticism if there's no agreement on the text that you're dealing with? You've got to have some ground to stand on if you're going to make an argument about style, for instance. Um, of course, you, you might argue that the textual tradition is such a mess that there is no safe ground to stand on. Um, you could make that argument for, say, Propertius, for example, that text is just is, is a dumpster fire. Um, how are you going to make it? And people do make arguments about um, Propertius's style. Is that safe? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm not sure I buy the argument that, that you shouldn't give people ground to stand on, though. Um, I think editors do have a function. And that function, in a nutshell, is to comprehend the messy history of a text and distill it down to an interface, an addition, that you can use without having to confront the mess at every single point. You should be able to confront that mess in all its glory if you want to, but you shouldn't have to have it forced on you. So in the end, <clears throat> we decided that our take on the digital edition should look a lot like the print versions that people are used to. But A, be more accessible, um, and B, give readers more control over the text they're reading. The great thing about um, digital objects, after all, is, is they're mutable. You can change them. Um, and innovation, obviously, is great, but it brings with it risks and burdens. We're already doing something really hard, um, so why make it harder on ourselves? What we decided to do was do a, a kind of uh, soup-to-nuts prototype of um, a a 1910 edition by uh, Cesare Giarratano of Calpurnius Siculus. So this is a shot of the first page of his Bucolica. He, he wrote, um, well, it's, it's a bit disputed when he wrote it. He might be Silver Age, um, so kind of the time of Nero, but he might also be later. Um, and he wrote Eclogues. He wrote Bucolic poetry. Um, you can see, by the way, the apparatus is bigger than the text, right? There's, there's a lot of mess here. Um, and it's, it's kind of a messy addition as well. But we chose something that was pretty messy because it's, if you work with hard stuff, um, you have to figure out how to deal with all the problems. Um, and, and we've had a fair amount of success doing that. So along the way, our decisions about um, interfaces have affected not just what our users will be able to do with our texts, but also what we've done with them. Um, and so, well, I'm going to talk just a little bit more, but then I'll transition into demo mode, and we can be, we can be a little bit more interactive then. Um, so, but I want to, I want to kind of explain um, some of the rhetoric of our current interface. Um, so I'll uh, outline. Um, some of the uh, decisions we've made. Um, you'll, you'll notice, by the way, I'm, I'm running this locally, um, even though all the stuff is, is up on the web because I am completely paranoid. Um, so we decided, um, you know, we're, we're going to keep the basic form of the critical edition. Um, it's going to look kind of like an OCT, an Oxford classical text or um, something like that. This decision led us to focus more on the text than on the system, at least so far. We didn't have to go and invent an architecture for marshalling arbitrary collections of related texts, for example. And crucially, we wouldn't be telling editors to stop doing what they do and instead focus on finding and transcribing every single version of the text. Uh, we, chose, we chose TEI, um, three more minutes. OK? Um, but we started late. OK. Well, that's not fair. OK. Um, but anyway, we can do question and answer while I'm showing the thing. Um, 
we chose TEI, obviously, so we're working with an existing framework. It's an imperfect one, obviously, um, but it's one we can adapt and even change if necessary. Um, we had a language we could use to model our text. We chose not to use XSLT in kind of the traditional TEI way um, to transform our text into standard HTML for display. And this is where we did decide to innovate, um, albeit based on prototypes that we, we demonstrated to work. Again, languages are interfaces. Um, so we decided what we'd do was convert our text into HTML5 custom elements instead. Um, if you're, here's an interface thing again, if you use XSLT, the default behavior if you don't have a template for an element is it throws away the markup and just gives you the text content, right? Doing it our way, you just keep everything. So what that means is then in your interface, you have all of your original model that you can do things with. Um, so this is where an interface might, this is an example of where an interface might betray you a little bit. Um, the default with XSLT is to kind of prune automatically. Um, and we didn't do that. We did choose um, to define Sigla for our apparatus in the, in the traditional way, but also if you mouse over them, you get immediate expansions. So it's kind of a bit more approachable. Um, also, we haven't thrown any information away, so if you give your definition of a Sigla um, anywhere in your TEI, um, and you're using an ID to reference it, then it's all right there for you just to grab in the interface. And we chose to let our users manipulate the reading text using the app crit. So here's where you pray for me. So um, we've done a couple of other things to it, obviously. We, uh, um, the, the introduction is, is translated into English, for example. Um, and in the addition, that's kind of huge. Let me that a little bit smaller. I didn't mean to reload. Okay. So over on the right, um, you see marks wherever there's a problem in the text. Um, and so you get to explore the apparatus that way. Um, and because we've done this kind of modeling stuff, um, for example, um, so in some editions, Antra there and Ista, the beginning of the next line, are flipped. Um, so really, if you change one, you should change the other. And what you can do is you can use the apparatus to drive what shows up in the text. So you can actually interactively explore um, the textual variation. Um, you're not forced to construct that model in your head the way you are with a print critical edition. Um, so changing Antra to Ista flips them here because in the TEI model, they're linked. Um, there's, a, there's a require um, attribute that points from one to the other. Let's go look at another one. So things like, um, things like transpositions can be difficult as well. Find the right line. So yeah, line. This is maybe where I should mirror, but anyway. Um, let's just go and show you a nasty one. So, yeah, lines six through eight of poem five um, are, get rearranged in different, um, in different versions. So if you want to see how they read in, um, in N and G, for example, um, you can just flip them around. <coughs> Um, or Maley's edition had them in yet a different order. And again, you can just flip them around. And you can do transpositions out of place as well. Um, you can do all kinds of weird stuff like that. And what we're doing, we can transition into question and answer mode now if you want. Um, 
I'm just going to mirror that. Okay. So if if you want to see what's happening behind the curtain as I do this. So let's see, that's line six. Okay, so here's the, here's the uh, TEI rendered into HTML custom elements. Um, and one set of readings has, um, has it in one order, um, and the others have it in a different one. So let's see if I can zoom that a little bit. And right, so there's our lamb. And what's happened is when I change things around, all I'm doing is in my, in my DOM, in my model, I'm changing the lem into a reading and the reading into a lem. And the browser's CSS and everything else just handles the rendering of the view for me, right? I can do things also like um, hide. Um, you know, this is one of the first things people asked. Um, you know, I don't want to see the orthographical variants. I don't want to see the morphological variants. Um, stuff like that that doesn't show up very well in here, which doesn't have a lot of them. 